The latest tragedy to hit Bangladesh's ready-made garments industry has once again brought the power and influence of the industry into sharp focus. The collapse of Rana Plaza, which is an eight-storey building housing five garment factories, is not the first incident of its kind. Back in 2005, a similar building collapsed in the same town, leaving 64 people dead. The factory owner was arrested then, but did not serve any time in prison. Since then, there have been fires, stampedes and other incidents at various garment factories and hundreds of deaths. Most recently, more than 100 workers perished at a fire in Ashulia, a township close to Dhaka, where hundreds of factories are located. In most of the incidents, critics say the deaths were preventable. Often, workers could not escape because exits were locked. But do workers from third world countries pay the price for the West's cheap clothes? Should pressure be brought to bear, either on the consumer, on the multinationals themselves, or on governments that allow these companies to operate in the way that they do? Well, to discuss this, I'm joined in the studio by Ruth Tanner. She's the Campaigns and Policy Director of War on Want, um, and will be joined by our studio in Washington, D.C. in a few minutes. But, um, Ruth, Thank you very much for joining us on this particular case. Uh, what's different about this? I mean, this, this seems to have made the headlines in a way that uh, I mentioned some of the other um, tragedies uh, in the last few months. But this seems to have captured the imagination in a way, uh, the imagination of the West in a way that other tragedies haven't. Why, why is that? I think the the sheer scale of um, this tragedy and the feeling that it almost looks like a natural disaster. I mean, it's so awful, so large. Um but when you realise that it was preventable and, you know, when people see how much their daily lives are linked to the lives of people in a country like Bangladesh, which seems like a very long way away. But, you know, the, the clothes we buy every day, the, the um, shops on our high streets, you know, are the buyers and, you know, are the, the, these are the workers who are making our clothes. The workers, I suppose, in, it's an industry that's grown very quickly in a country like Bangladesh, and it, and it accounts for something like 80% of the country's export earning. Um, do you think that that means that it's a sector that is too big to fail in Bangladesh as far as the Bangladeshi government is concerned? And, um, and that's something that international governments need to lobby them over. I think what's really important here is we've um, always been very clear that this shouldn't be a boycott campaign, um, You know that, we, that we're not about... Um, making it more difficult for people to get these jobs in Bangladesh. I mean, 80% of the people working in this industry are women. Um, this industry really matters. As you say, it matters the Bangladeshi economy. Um, our focus really is on the power of the, the massive corporations in the West who are able to both influence negatively um, on the, the way these workers are treated because of the nature of that business, the nature of how they work, um, but also have the potential to influence positively through, you know, it's things like a good living wage, um, good terms and conditions, uh, the right to unionise, um, and obviously the issue that's been brought into really stark reality this week, which is the issue of real health and safety in the structures of buildings. Um, the role we think governments need to play is is really that a lot of the companies that um, you know have been linked to this particular um, crisis, this particular tragedy. They, you know, a lot of them are signed up to voluntary terms and, condi you know, sort of voluntary initiatives. A lot of them speak good words about ethical practice. And we don't actually see that in reality. And I think what we've seen in Bangladesh this week at Rana Plaza um, really brings home the, the stark contrast between the, the good words, the ethical words of the companies and the reality of what happens to their workers. But uh, I suppose this case is slightly different in that the owner um, is, is accused of building additional floors on top of an already... Uh, full building, and perhaps that's something that the, that the people who are the customers, the Western clients, would not necessarily be aware of. I mean, what, what, or is this, or is this, is this an attitude that um, they have to absolutely uh, meet the orders at a price that the Western companies like Primark want? That's exactly the sort of thing that these companies should be aware of. Um, you couldn't imagine in the UK that um, a company wouldn't feel responsibility for the sort of structures that the people who are their suppliers are working in. And one of the things that we've been calling for and many people around the world have been calling for are proper um, standards that are engaged with this issue of building construction. And the, um, there's a call for a fire and safety plan, something that actually um, would mean that companies had to get around the table and were mandated to be more engaged with this issue. Because, as you say, we've known that the, um, there was illegal construction on the site. You know, three stories were illegally there, that there'd been a building collapse nearby um, not that long before, and that 
the companies are supposed to be running audits. They're supposed to be engaged with the issue of the safety of their suppliers. One particular company, Primark, um, which is very well known on the high street in the UK, you know, Primark has already now said that they will pay compensation. We, you know, have high expectations that that will be full compensation. But they've said that and they've claimed that they have some responsibility. And I think that's really key that they do see the responsibility. You know, this shouldn't have happened. People shouldn't have been working in that building, it would seem. And it is the responsibility of companies to make sure there are proper checks on their suppliers. So what about the responsibility of consumers? I mean, do you, do you see a case like this in particular with um, horrific scenes, people, uh, hundreds of people dying and, and, and potentially hundreds more? Do you think that this makes people stop and think where their clothes come from? Or are we a long way away from mm. that? I mean, we um, have run a petition um, in the last few days and have had an incredible response. We've had about 70,000 people um, have already signed the petition calling for companies to take responsibility, to play compensation and to sign up to um, future initiatives to ensure this sort of thing doesn't happen again. So I think people really do care about it and are shocked and angry about what's happened. But it's about, I think, turning that anger not purely into a kind of feeling that you have to act as a consumer and maybe buy a little bit less or boycott a particular brand and actually feel that as citizens we need to ensure that companies based here in the UK or in, in Western countries um, are forced to act and act in a way that's decent to the workers who are making our clothes. You know, this is why we say this is not a boycott campaign. We don't want these workers to lose their jobs. You know, we don't want um, the companies to cut and run, but we want these to be decent jobs. You know, people have the right to work their way out of poverty rather than work for poverty ranges in dangerous conditions. Well, I'll cross now to our studio in Washington, D.C. with Jamila Bay. Well, thank you so very much. I am Jamila Bay here in the Washington, D.C. studios of Voice of Russia Radio. And, of course, this Bangladesh factory fire is indeed something that the world is talking about here in the U.S. Uh, many of our companies, Walmart, Target, Sean John, uh, are likely to have had workers in that particular fire who were making low low-cost clothing. Uh, Charles Kernigan is our guest here. He is the executive director of the Institute for Global Labor and Human Rights, and he is known perhaps to many in America and many around the world as the man who made Kathy Lee Gifford the celebrity host and former gospel singer cry. Um, Charles, thank you so much for being with me today. Well, thank you. Now, this this conversation we're having absolutely gets into that conversation you had with Kathy Lee years ago, back in 1996, when she claimed, well, I'm a celebrity endorser. I really don't know the conditions of the workers who are making my clothes. Um, what then is my responsibility? And um, you you did not mince words in talking to her. Would you refresh us uh, how you explained uh, the level of, you know, culpability really does not end with the moment one signs a contract, be they a celebrity endorser or be they a corporation who, you know, takes advantage of these low-cost workers? Well, yes. Well, in, in the, the, the case of Kathleen Gifford, we had written her um, because we had discovered in Honduras on one of our trips we found that there were children making the Kathy Lee Gifford label. And we met with the workers in a very broken down, uh, you know, bodega behind a wall where no one could see us. And the workers came and showed us labels that had the picture of Kathy Lee Gifford on it and said a certain portion of the proceeds from this garment will go to various children's charities. The only problem was is that the workers were children. And it was a Walmart label. It was Walmart Scotty Lee label. So uh, when I got back to the United States, I wrote her a letter uh, asking her to help. And that's when she went crying on television, waving the letter that I had written to her saying, Mr. Sit by your phone, you're going to get sued, <laughs> and on and on and on. But uh, the tragedy was uh, that the place was full of kids. And we, in fact, brought one of them, a young woman and a, and a senior uh, woman who was a very great union rights person in Honduras, we went to testify in the Congress, and we just cleaned their clocks because uh, it, it was riddled with with uh, child labor. Uh, and, you know, Walmart uh, lied, and Kathy Lee Gifford lied, and, and so on, until the truth eventually came out. Now, 
Yesterday, of course, was May Day, and uh, workers around the world raised their voices to say, we are humans, we demand decent and safe working conditions, we want the right to organize and unionize if necessary. Um, this, uh, in, in this current climate here in the U.S. of anti-unionism, really does sound a bit perhaps the word radical could be raised. However, if we look back to 2007, uh, that wasn't the case, even here in Washington, here on Capitol Hill. There there was bipartisan support for uh, working conditions that were fair and equitable. And in fact, I'd love it if you would talk a little bit about the 175 members of, of the House who signed on to what what's called the Decent Working Conditions and Fair Competition Act. What would that do? Um, of course, that's not before the Congress right now. But mm-hmm. how does that particular piece of legislation affect the things we're talking about and, and affect the goods that go to market here in the U.S., absolutely in the U.K. and further abroad? Well, it's very concrete. Like, for example, right now the death toll in Bangladesh is up to 435, and they say 149 are missing. Uh, so we're, we're reaching almost upwards of 600 workers dead, and, and there's other people saying there's 1,000 people missing. So this is an unbelievable tragedy that needs to be addressed, and the workers have to be liberated and treated like human beings. The legislation was very, very simple. It was actually based, the 2007 legislation was actually based on the Dog and Cat Protection Act because uh, we had found out that that the Burlington Coat Factory in New York City was making these nice leather jackets, but uh, they had beautiful fur collars. But they were so stupid on the label, uh, they actually, it says, comes to uh, the label fur, and it says dog fur and cat fur. So, of course, dogs and cats were being killed and skinned in China so that there could be nice fur collars on these jackets. We, we uh, raised this with the media, with a bunch of other people, and lo and behold, the minute that the Congress found out that dogs and cats were being abused and killed for, for fur, uh, they went ballistic, and they punched each other out. They jumped up in front of the, the, the podium and the microphones, and everybody wanted to talk, and they were saying, nobody's going to kill dogs and cats in our watch. Nobody. We can remember every single dog we've ever had. My children love them, and every single senator and House member went on, and they unanimously passed the Dog and Cat Protection Act, which said is that you cannot export dog fur or cat fur to the U.S., you can't import it, and you can't sell it. So the Congress stood up very bravely to protect dogs and cats. And so the minute we were involved in that, we immediately said, let's try to help human beings now that the dogs are, and cats are, are safer. And that's where this legislation came from. And, and on the Senate side, um, it's the 110th Congress. It was then Senator Barack Obama who endorsed this legislation. It was Hillary Clinton. It was Joe Biden. It was it was uh, 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 Senator Dogan. Uh, it was about 27 members of the Senate and in the House close to 170 members. And the bill was based actually on the Dog and Cat Fur Act. It was the Decent Working Conditions and Fair Competition Act. And all it said was, you know, we're not setting wages around the world. That's up to the workers in these countries. So we're not going to pontificate that what wages should be. That's up to the local country and the local workers. But what we are going to say is you're not bringing uh, sweatshop products into the United States if those products are violated under the ILO, the International Labor Organization's Worker Rights Standards, which the whole world says they agree to. So the standards are very simple. We're not setting wages, but you will not bring a product into the United States if it was made by a child. Mm-hmm. It was made by forced labor. You're not bringing it into the United States if the workers do not have their right to organize, to have a union, to bargain collectively. Mm-hmm. If you violate that, and, or you violate decent working conditions, this product will not be able to enter the United States, and it can't be sold in the United States, and it can't be in the U.S. So what we're saying is, if the whole world agrees that the ILO labor standards, the international labor organizations, inter- internationally recognized worker rights standards are adhered to, uh, we could make a world of difference 
all across the world because the United States, of course, is one of the most powerful uh, countries. And if we could get this, this bill out, and on top of it, when we did a Harris poll, 76% of the American people want this legislation. They want the rights of workers to be enforced. Mm-hmm. So what's holding this up is a dysfunctional Congress. And until there are laws to protect the human being, mm-hmm. right now, the label's protected. Absolutely. Intellectual property and copyright rights. So, Mr. Kernigan, you know, in other words, yes. Um, I, I, I want to I want to jump in and, and ask Ruth Tanner to uh, provide to provide the perspective for uh, folks in the UK. We know that uh, American legislators think this is wonderful. Um, American consumers think that these protections are necessary and common sense. I can't imagine that our friends across the pond don't feel so. Uh, Ms. Tanner, would you would you let us know? Have you done any polling or can you point to any statistics about what is the what is the feeling of of, of British uh, consumers? Um, yeah, I mean, the, the thing we've we've just done, which is a petition uh, responding specifically to this case, to this tragedy. And it's had, um, you know, 70,000 people have signed it in, in a matter of days. And we've had, you know, an incredible outpouring of response um, in terms of people's anger and concern. And they're very much directed at the companies. I don't think people in the UK, um, you know, are, con- are confused about who holds responsibility here. And there is a feeling that it is the companies, it is the high street chains that are responsible. And, you know, we've um, again and again sort of seen a lot of companies make the point that that they aspire to, uh, you know, to living up to the standards, to the ILO standards, which many of them have, have signed up to say they support. But yet we don't see that reality on the ground. And for that reason, I think it's really, really key that, you know, things that are more mandatory where companies are started to be forced to act. You know, we saw these changes happening, you know, 100 years ago here in the UK that, you know, health and safety legislation, companies being forced um, to protect um, human beings, protect workers. You know, that's considered normal um, in the UK. It's considered, it's highly expected. It's expected of the companies we're talking about here. But those expectations aren't the same in the supply chains. And, and clearly what we've seen this week shows that that's just not on. But in terms of um, your call for not a boycott, that these goods should not be boycotted, given, I suppose, the importance it has to a country like Bangladesh, it empowers women as well, a considerable uh, proportion of the workforce who work in these garment factories are uh, women. I mean, is it not, isn't it, is it not used as fuel, as, as a kind of cause by anti-globalists to uh, move shift production out of these developing countries and back into the West? Um, be, uh, I mean, certainly comment over the last week or so, many uh, anti-sweatshop campaigners, if you call them that, would be quite happy to see these factories um, shut down, almost globalisation reversed. I mean, is there a way of um, not conflating those two issues, pushing for better rights, but let's accept let's let, let's accept that cheap goods will be will be produced in these countries. I think, I mean, it is, like you say, it's got, global trade is a complicated issue and it's not that we on all, you know, all sectors and, and all sorts of trade would um, always support the, the way these, these chains work. But I think in the manufacturing sector, in the garment sector, um, particularly how it plays out in countries like Bangladesh, um, you know, this is a key industry for Bangladesh. It's vitally important. And we very much take our lead from the partners we work with on the ground. We work with the National Garment Garment Workers Federation, which you know we know already have lost um, a num- you know tens of members in this particular factory, um, and, and many more of their members are injured. So they're very much on the ground working on this today, and they've always been very clear that they don't want a boycott. They want us to act um, in the West to make sure these companies are held to account, but. If people stop buying the clothes, then and if this industry falls apart, then that will only have a negative effect on the workers. But that's not the same as saying that the way this um, industry works at the moment is okay. It's not okay. The the push for fast fashion, you know, the the outsourcing down the supply chain, which means that um, the suppliers. I'm under huge amounts of pressure to deliver. That pressure gets put onto the workers. Um, you know, these companies are making massive profits. Only at the beginning of last week, a few days before this tragedy, um, Primark, one of the key players in this particular case, um, posted posted profits. And, you know, they sell 
products for for pennies in the UK at the moment. And so people know that they're making huge profits at the expense of workers. And this is the thing they think is not OK. Back to you, Jamila, in DC. Jamila Bay here. I want to. Oh, yeah. Thank you so much. Uh, I want us to talk for a moment uh, about the issue that I think is the elephant in the room, that we are talking about uh, developing nations. Here in the U.S., many of our low-wage workers, in addition to being female, they are Hispanic, they are black, they are from disenfranchised uh, populations. And, and you know, I'm not saying that because of that there's the feeling that companies can exploit and do whatnot, but I do wonder if the fact that we are talking about folks who really, you know, are, are at the mercy of their employers, if perhaps this is part of the reason. These are not people who, um, you know, have the knowledge and have the know-how. Uh, they, they are at the whim of who will hire them, who will provide them the income to feed their families. Um, is this a class issue that we're completely not talking about, particularly uh, those of us who enjoy cheap goods here in the USA? Mr. Kernigan. Yeah, I think that's 100 percent accurate. I, I have listening to the conversation. I, I've never heard of any uh, human rights or labor rights or women's rights organization ever want to shut down people in Bangladesh. It's never even been raised. Uh, but what is missing in this discussion is there are 5,000 factories in Bangladesh and three and a half to four million garment workers, and they need the right to organize. That comes first. That is the big issue. Uh, we can have codes of conduct. We can talk until we're blue in the face. Uh, until the workers, and there isn't a single union in Bangladesh that has a collective contract, uh, until the National Garment Workers Federation is free to actually organize workers and have workers organized in these factories uh, and the Bangladesh Workers Solidarity Center and others. In other words, this is what really needs to happen. These workers need to be empowered and they need the support from the UK and from the United States and from Canada and, and uh, all across the world. Uh, without the labor union, this thing is under. And yes, of course, they think they can exploit these workers and throw them away. A uh, young woman today, we were just talking with her, uh, and she bo lost both of her legs in this, in this collapse. Uh, and uh, it, it's just criminal. It, in, indeed. And in fact, there are calls in Bangladesh to enact the death penalty against the owners of, of this particular factory. But, you know, again, we, we see these horrific abuses. We see sexual abuses of poor workers. Mm -hmm. um, we see every type of abuse imaginable, physical, emotional, financial. And again, I, I do want to just ask once more, just, just to hammer home the point, no one's asking for a boycott of this, but what should consumers be thinking of? What should consumers be doing when, when we hear these stories and we feel the outrage, but we don't know what to do when it comes to clothing ourselves and our families? Oh, yeah, like uh, you said before, I believe that there, you know, people are not stupid. We have a terrible economy, so people are not 100% engaged because we're fighting for to, to, to stay alive uh, with our very poor economy. Uh, but people are not stupid. They know that these products are being made under harsh sweatshop conditions in dangerous factories that can fall down around you where workers don't have their rights. Uh, we do, like the, like the uh, woman said, uh, the, about the, the 70,000 people signing on to the petition, uh, you know, that stuff really does work. Uh, and we've done similar uh, petitions like this, and the American people want to be involved. Uh, but, honestly... We have to be involved through our government because our government has the power, not, uh, you know, uh, the, the, the people themselves. We need our government to go to bat and say to the Bangladeshi government, we want things to go forward. You know, we know how badly you need this, this, uh, this garment industry, but uh, you're going to have to play ball with the right to organize absolutely and the workers to have a, a, a collective contract and better health and safety conditions will help but yes. we're gonna have to play ball together and okay. so i think it's the governments that count mr kernigan thank you so much this is charles kernigan the executive director of the institute for global labor and human rights based in pittsburgh pennsylvania i want to toss back to brandon cole in our voice of russia studio in london this is jamila bay 
Thanks, Jamila. And just finally, um, Ruth Tanner, do you think we'll, there'll, become a, there'll come a point when um, we'll care as much about the provenance of our clothes as we do about our food? Um, I think what we've seen this week could be a tipping point. I mean, this story has hit the headlines like no other um, in relation to this issue. And I think people have been really touched. And I think uh, Charles's point is key. You know, this is um, about both letting people know as, as consumers that there's something wrong about this supply chain and what's happening, but also making people act as citizens and getting governments to act and companies to act. Well, we'll have to leave it there. Ruth Tanner, Campaigns and Policy Director from The War on Want, joining me in the London studio with Jamila Bay in Washington was Charles Kernigan from the Institute for Global Labour and Human Rights based in Pittsburgh. After the break, Tim Eckert will be discussing the Syrian crisis with a prominent blogger. That's after a short news update.